yesterday we broached the very large topic of language, generally. And we came at language from a couple of perspectives. The first thing we did was we noted that language is not only a means of communication, although it is obviously a means of communication, it also plays a very distinct role in our inner economy of thought. And we argued strongly that there's uh, such a deep link that there are thoughts you couldn't have unless you had language. You're required for this reading, a uh, reading for this week, is in fact a consideration of what thought might be like if you didn't have language. We met Jerry Fodor, who emphasized the strong link between some aspects of what we loosely call thinking and the structure of language, pointing out that thoughts are structured much as sentences are structured. And I particularly like this example. If three of us sneak in the back, we can steal at least a bag of apples without getting caught. Seems to imply a sophisticated, structured thought, very complex thought, that would be absolutely impossible without language. That's a claim. I don't know whether you buy it or not. Um, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that having language changes us radically and allows us to achieve things that we couldn't have achieved otherwise. Um, we see that language can also be viewed as a kind of a tool, a means to get things done in the world. And this is an interesting perspective on language because la having language has certainly changed us as a species. But we saw an interesting example of a precursor to language. So before you can have language, you must have individual symbols. We might call them words, we might not. But you must have some kind of facility for using symbols to stand for something else. And we saw the example of the chimpanzees, where Shiva was trained in the use of numerical symbols. And then when she was introduced to the game, where she was presented repeatedly with two plates of treats, one of the plates has more treats than the other. And the one that she points at is the one that her friend, Sarah, gets, and she gets the other one. Well, when the treats are displayed directly, then Sheba can't help but point at the plate with more treats, which leads to her friend getting the plate. And that's really frustrating. But when we introduce the indirectness of symbolic reference, we cover these and put numeric symbols on the front, then she can stand back from the task distance herself a little bit from this appetite of flow of desire in the here and now, and she can simply point. She can figure it out and point to the plate with a smaller numeral on it, and that way she solves the problem of getting more treats. So in this case, even being able to use symbols fundamentally changes the kind of problems that she can solve. Because language has been so extremely effective, we considered how language might have come, to, come into being. How did it happen to this species and not to others? We saw that this is a really difficult question to address. And we saw that even in the, in the end of the 19th century in France, the French Academy of Sciences even tried to stop scientists from making guesses here because there seemed to be no evidence. But we can do better than nothing whatsoever. We can ask, for example, about pre-adaptation, which structures need to be in place in order for language to be possible, because language doesn't actually make use of any structures that aren't already there. Every part of the body that's used in language is also used for something else. We have computer simulations where we can look at how the process of symbolic communication combined with processes of change leads to the uh, generation of complex messages, for example. That's a really interesting area. And we looked at genetics as a possible field of explanation. Of course, that wasn't available at the end of the 19th century. And we followed the case of KE and the FOXP2 gene, but we realized that there will never be a simple genetic story. There's no single gene that gave us language. And it's here that we want to pick up the story today. And I want to return to one hypothesis about a contributing factor in the development of language that seems to me to be very worth our attention. It's one that is quite recent. So this comes from 2007. Uh, it comes from the lab of Michael Tomasello, who's a primatologist working in Germany. A primatologist studies the behavior of apes and tries to understand it with what we know about humans to spot relations, similarities, and differences. Now, if we look at our relation to apes, 
if we look at the tree of evolutionary descent, it's only five or six million years ago since you would encounter the last common ancestor of humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, and that's not very much time. So something happened to our species in the intervening period that didn't happen to the other apes, and it radically changed us. It gave us the basis for human society, for human culture, for indeed for doing science, for doing religion, for doing all those things that humans do that have led us to take over the globe, potentially even destroying it in the process, and that didn't happen to the apes. So what on earth could it be? That period of time, five or six million years, is not long enough to evolve radically new structures. The brains of apes, our closest relatives, are almost identical to human brains. There's very, very little difference. There's no kind of cell you find in a chimpanzee brain that you won't, or, or in a human brain that you won't find in a chimpanzee cell. There's slight differences in shape. Our frontal lobes are bigger, but that's about it. So something happened, and in evolutionary terms, it's a bit of a mystery because the consequences are so profound. Well, Tomasello's suggestion here is a very interesting one. There we do know of one small biological change that happened in the interim, and from the point of view of biological change, it's just one small change, but the consequences of it might be profound. Among all the apes, humans are the only ones that have a white in the eye. The sclera of the eye is white, as you can see there, and we have a darker iris and a dark pupil turning our eyes into extremely effective signals for communicating where we're looking. Now, apes have dark eyeballs. They don't have light eyeballs. So you can't see this high contrast signal that tells you where you're looking. A chimpanzee will try to figure out where another chimpanzee is paying attention to, but they'll follow the direction of the head. If my head is like this, I'm obviously looking over there. If my head is like this, I'm obviously looking over there. But compared with how you can read a human eyeball, that's a really crude signal. Humans are very, very attentive to and sensitive to exactly where someone is looking. You notice whether someone's looking at your eyes or elsewhere. You know, if you look at someone in the wrong way, you get punched. We are extremely sensitive to where people look and how they look. And we have this strong signal telling us where someone is looking that the apes don't have available to them. As a result, human infants from a very, very early point in their development, from birth pretty much, are surrounded in a sea of what we call joint attention. That is, they know where their caregivers are looking and they can look at the same thing, so that the in and that structures a human interaction. It means you adopt a common perspective. It means that if you're paying attention to the same thing, you're going to come at the world, understand everything, interpret things in a similar way. You're going to interpret some things as being part of your interaction, some things as being external. You're going to be susceptible to the same kinds of threats. You're going to to valorize the same kinds of things. This business of joint attention is hugely important in structuring a shared world. Now, child psychologists have looked at children's understanding of gaze, and boy, do they get it. Children understand very, very rapidly. In the first year of life, they learn to attend to where their caregivers are looking. And before they're a year and a half old, they learn to manipulate the gaze of their carers so that they can cause the carer to look somewhere that they want to look. So infants are immersed in this world of joint attention from a very early stage. So there we have a small biological change, which hugely changes the kind of social relations that we have, hugely changes, I, I would say, almost it facilitates the development of a shared perspective on the world. And that seems to be something that language requires. Language could be exploiting this shared perspective on the world. We don't know, it's very early days yet, but this cooperative eye hypothesis of Tomasello is a remarkably uh, fascinating and intriguing suggestion of how a small biological change can have hugely profound changes in how we get along, how we coordinate our being. Okay, we, look, we noted that language has come to play an increasing role in all our theories of mind and of who we are. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start looking at the way that the study of language is organized in universities today and within the mainstream science. If you do a linguistics degree, you will have classes in pragmatic, semantics, syntax, morphology, phonology, and phonetics. That constitutes a kind of a core for the current study of language. There are many other disciplines you might study. You might study field methods, applied linguistics, language development, second language acquisition. Those are all possible fields, but this is 
the core of the modern scientific study of language. And today we're going to step through those just to find out what they are. We're going to start with pragmatics, which is very much in the real world and is concerned with how people really use language. We're going to start at a dinner table with someone asking for the salt. Then we're going to enter different kinds of abstraction, intellectual abstraction, that scientists have generated in order to try to understand language use. And we're going to re-emerge, probably the next day, down here in phonetics, back in the real physical world of meat and spit, as I like to put it. So we're going, to, going on a journey of abstraction to find, find out how scientists have sort of broken down the task of language. But it's really important to say that there's no, language is not a simple phenomenon. Language is an extremely rich domain. People have been studying language for thousands of years. It's possibly the oldest science. Astronomy and grammar are possibly the oldest sciences. The Sanskrit grammarians, two and a half, three thousand years ago, were producing learned treatises on the structure of language and trying to understand the nature of thought and mind on the basis of this. Wow! They were way ahead of us. We're only catching up. The way that language is treated in contemporary linguistics, this orthodoxy, does not exhaust the topics of language, and it leaves out an awful lot. It represents, as it were, one view that's informed by the language of the second half of the 20th century and the study of minds as kind of computer programmers, as, as programs, as, as mind as a kind of a computation done over symbols. We've met this before. The study of language is older, and here, just to situate that discussion, we'll adopt the usual convention sort of before 1900, we've got, <laughs> I don't know, the Dark Ages. Then we got the first half of the 20th century, and then we got the second half of the 20th century. These dates are all really, really rough. Okay? But just what it is that scientists are studying when they study language has changed in this time. And the study of language in the discipline known as philology, we wouldn't even call it science, but it has been a respected academic specialization for, oh, 1,500, 2,000 years. Um, so let's start with that, and then we look at the structural linguistics, and then we move into the more modern generative linguistics. Philology. If you go back into the 19th and 18th and 17th and 16th centuries, right back to the Middle Ages and before then, there's always been scholars who were really good at studying language, because we've always had a need for this. But the motivation has changed over the years. A lot of the motivation at those, those stages would have been the authority given to religious texts. So there were scholars who were responsible for un understanding, curating, interpreting religious texts, deciding which belonged to the canon and which were apocryphal. Um, the study of the Bible and the Quran are full of such things. So the skilled interpretation of sacred texts is one area of specialization that's been around forever. Similarly, our travel habits have changed. Rather, we've acquired travel habits. We didn't used to have them. People used to stay at home. You were born somewhere, you stayed in that field, and you died there. You didn't get in a plane and go to China and get off in a Starbucks and take out your phrase book and try and order a tall, skinny latte in Chinese. That's an entirely modern sort of scenario. But there were people, even though they stayed at home much more, were exposed to other languages, primarily the languages of classical learning. So Greek and Latin were taught in school. They were valorized. They were a normal part of education. None of you have probably been trained in classical Greek and classical Latin. Who here has been trained in any Latin? Yay, it's not dead. Who has been trained in any ancient Greek? It's dead. <laughs> Sorry about that. But there's always been this desire to teach a particular sanctioned form of scholarly languages to others. English, incidentally, plays that role now. If you're growing up in China or in Saudi Arabia or in uh, anywhere in the world, if you want to enter into academic discourse, you're going to have to learn English. It's not fair, and it's not the whole of English, but English has become, has replaced Latin and Greek in that respect. It used to be only the wealthy who got to go abroad. These days, anyone can afford a Ryanair flight, but uh, as the travel opened up and people became aware that they could actually go to France and look at those weird people across the channel, um, so the desire to learn foreign languages kind of increased as well. Um, and certain texts have always been valorized more than others. So if you go to school these days, you're more likely to learn Shakespeare than Mills and Boone romance or Fifty Shades or something like that. Um, so some texts have always been greatly preferred to others and will be taught and interpreted in certain ways. And this leads to a certain kind of preference expressed in education 
for some linguistic structures and language habits over others. So philology is all this business of the scholarly study of texts, including how we decipher them, interpret them, sort them out, choose good ones, prefer ones over the others. It's not science, but it's the ground from which a science of language emerged. And the science of language emerged around the same time as the science of mind, second half of the 19th century. And um, it really became established at the start of the 20th century with the work of this guy, Ferdinand de Saussure, who established a school known as Structural Linguistics. The idea here was to be systematic in your observations. So just as with the science of the mind, what we had was a lot of people who had a lot of observations, who knew things, who wrote things down, made up tables, measured stuff. And somehow, in order to ground the science, you need some theory behind all that. You need to systematize your observations, first of all, so that you can identify general phenomena and undercover rules and regularities that might be hidden to the naked eye. This is the science as mystic, organizing the world and providing the right framework to understand our observations. The systematic observation of language gave rise to structural linguistics, which was more or less replaced around the middle of the 20th century by modern linguistics, which we'll emphasize. But if you want to get a flavor for this kind of systematization, I suggest looking at these two pictures here. On the bottom right, you see the periodic table of the elements, which was also a product of the second half of the 19th century. And it systematized a lot of observations in the domain of chemistry. There was lots of people who had been playing around with substances for thousands of years. We knew a lot, but it wasn't systematically organized. And the brilliant insight of the periodic table was that by organizing what we know in this fashion, we could recognize generalities. Some things would just jump off the page. The rows and the columns, sorry, the rows and the columns represent meaningful collections of elements that have some things in common. Now compare that with up here, you see the 2005 version of something that's been in draft since about 1880, 1890, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. This concentrating just on the consonants in this particular version, we see likewise a tabular organization, which tries to organize systematic groups. The rows and the columns are differently organized here, and the attempt is to capture the kinds of consonants and the consonantal contrasts that you would find in any human language, not just in English or in Italian, but in any human language. A vain goal that will never be reached, but it's still the goal of the International Phonetic Association. The rows here refer to the way that the consonant is made. Is it made by stopping the air completely, like p, or is it made by trilling, for example, like v? Uh, and the columns here represent where the sound is made. So those were both made by my lips, but I can make sounds here behind my teeth, like ta-da, or the back of my mouth, like ka-ga. Uh, so that's this, how this is systematically organized. You can see there are gaps there, and there's some sounds that either are not attested or are judged to be impossible. So this way of organizing the observations became really, really important. And now out of this was born modern linguistics. And this happened around the middle of the 20th century, and we've already been following this. In the 40s, we got a new vocabulary of information processing. In the 40s and 50s, the world of computation came to occupy the minds of many kinds of scientists. The um, understanding of the mind as some kind of computational activity, that means, in essence, the rule-based reorganization of symbols um, in order to create meaning. This is very language-like, and we've met the interaction of this novel science of linguistics, in this case generative linguistics, with the birth of modern psychology, of cognitive psychology. This is Noam Chomsky, whose work, formal work on language was absolutely crucial here. His domain was syntax, and that's at the very heart of the disciplines that we'll be looking at today. And it's closely related to this language of information processing and thinking about minds as being computer-like. It's also a mathematical way. So here's where we're going today. We're going to step through these, starting with pragmatics at the dinner table, going through semantics and syntax, that's Chomsky, so this is the heart of it. Morphology is almost a variant on syntax. Then we descend into the world of sound. So we start with meaning, move down to symbols, move down to sounds, and re-emerge in the world of meat and spit in phonetics. 
We're going to start with pragmatic stone. Imagine we're at the dinner table, and Daddy says, please pass me the salt. And little snot nose Joey says, oh, sorry, sorry, Daddy says, can you pass me the salt? Snot nose Joey says, yep, and doesn't do it. How annoying is that? Right? When someone says, can you pass me the salt, they're not actually inquiring into your abilities. They're trying to do something in the world. They're trying to change the position of the salt cellar so that it's at hand. That's what someone is doing when they say, can you pass me the salt? As language users, you're well aware of this, and you're being obtuse if you interpret, can you pass me the salt, in any other way than a request for the salt cellar. The philosopher of language, Ludwig Wittgenstein, summed this up very nicely. He said, if you want to study language, don't worry too much about meaning and reference and all that difficult stuff. He spent the first half of his life worrying about all that. He said, just look at how people use language. What are they actually doing with language? They're using language to achieve something, to get things done in the world. Remember language as a tool? So this is the domain of pragmatics. It looks to see how does the noises that come out of your mouth, how do they affect your world? Why did you use those noises rather than these noises? And what did you achieve? So it's, it's kind of like asking about meaning, but it's a very practical, grounded, context-sensitive context use of meaning where the same sentence uttered under different circumstances might produce different results. So the can you pass the salt is a good way of reminding ourselves that language is not simply the encoding of meaning, but it's a context-bound means of achieving something in the world. Now there's a chap called Grice who formulated what he called conversational maxims. This is in the domain of pragmatics. What Grice was getting at here was he was trying to point out that when we engage in conversation, there are framing assumptions that we don't make explicit. We're not aware of them most of the time, but they're there. They're sure as hell there. And when someone violates those assumptions, that's a signal that's really, really important. So when little Jimmy says no, he's not just failing to, he's not failing to understand. He's making a different move. He's annoying someone. He's being deliberately obtuse. So in any conversation, even if you're having a disagreement and you're having an argument, you might think you're not agreeing. You might not be agreeing about the bank balance or about where to go for dinner, but you're agreeing on how to structure a conversation. You're agreeing that there are turns that we, your questions receive responses. You're agreeing on an awful lot of things. And these conversational maxims was an attempt to write down some of the things that people are necessarily agreeing on. The word maxim is important here. They're not rules, because rules would suggest that you shouldn't break them. And you're quite free to violate these maxims. They look like rules, but they're not. But every time you violate one, if your conversational partner becomes aware of that, that's really important information for your conversational partner. So here are some of the maxims. For example, the maxim of truth. Don't say what you believe to be false, or likewise, don't say that for which you have adequate evidence. Obviously, you can violate this. You're all capable of telling lies. I'm sure you're brilliant at it. But if someone comes into the room and says, boy, it's wet outside, you don't sit there and question the evidentiary basis of their observation. You assume they've been outside and that they have some basis for saying this. That's the natural assumption. Um, if someone says a lie, you don't just go, oh, you violated conversation maxims. You go, why did they tell me that lie? You start looking for motives. You want to understand it. It's very important. If you recognize something as a lie, it's very important that you figure out why it was a lie. The maximum of quantity can be summed up under TMI. Don't add more information than is necessary, but add as much information as is necessary. So if uh, you can buy, if you're well, you, familiar with how you, these might be violated, don't add more information than is required. So you are at the water cooler and you say, how are you, to someone, and they start telling you the budgie died and the, the, there was a flood in the cellar and the crashed the car on the way in. That's not what you were expecting. That violates this maximum of TMI. But it's also important information because these are all extremely important things to pay attention to. That's why it's been violated. So we've got uh, an expectation that's not met. Likewise, you're supposed to contribute as much information as is required. If there's a big crash outside and someone comes running in and you say, what happened? And they say something. That's not good enough. You've got to provide more information than that. There's a strong expectation for information. Relevance, the maximum of relevance. 
be relevant. Of course you're capable of making irrelevant statements. You probably do it occasionally. If you do it all the time, you are certifiably insane. This is one of the hallmarks of the insane, is the inability to be relevant, to perceive a situation and contribute to it in the way that most folks do. Clarity, the maximum of clarity, suggests that you should avoid being obscure or ambiguous or brief or orderly, unless of course you want to be ambiguous or lengthy or disorderly or obscure. Sometimes you want that, but the fact that you're violating this is important information in itself. The ambiguity might be the cue to someone that they have to think hard about what you just said because there's a secret hidden meaning. So these are not rules of the kind that you shouldn't violate, but they are assumptions that seem to structure all conversations, and when you violate them, that is itself meaningful. So pragmatics is dealing with meaning, but it's this context-bound pragmatic sense of how do I achieve things with words. That's the top of our stack. Now we're going to go down to the treatment of meaning within formal linguistics proper, and that's semantics. And I did linguistics as an undergraduate, and I was hugely disappointed with semantics, because I expected it to cover the science of meaning. I, I assumed there was a science of meaning that covered everything you might mean with meaning. Semantics takes the term meaning and interprets it in a very restricted sense. The sense that logicians like, mathematicians like. Here's an example of some aspects of meaning that the field of semantics can get at. The sentence is, all Dubliners are not dumb, does not mean quite the same thing as not all Dubliners are dumb, although people are sometimes sloppy in their usage here. Consider if I go out there and I find one dumb Dubliner. It's going to be hard, but I might find one. If I do, then the first sentence, all Dubliners are not dumb, has been falsified, because I found one. The second one, not all Dubliners are dumb, is not falsified, it's not touched by that. So semantics captures this, and that's asking about how do these words all and not, how do they work, for example, logically. We can also ask, do the words student and pupil, do they mean the same things, in what context do they mean the same things, Is, could you replace one with the other? Well, we note here that in order to address this, you need some real-world understanding. If I refer to a kid in primary school as a student, I'm being a bit nice about it, you know. If I refer to you guys as pupils, you might take offense. In secondary school, the student-pupil thing is kind of overlaps, and it's not quite clear which is which. So there are interesting questions to ask whether these words mean the same thing, um, and they introduce questions of reference, or how are they used in a broader context. Most work within semantics employs tools drawn from formal logic, which is a branch of mathematics. And it's a way of expressing relations such as being the same word. So student pupil, or we might, here's another example, sofa and couch, might be argued to be synonyms. That's a relation between two words. It means that they mean the same thing. Meaning the same thing, meaning the same thing to a semantician doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as meaning the same thing to you. So I have a suspicion, and I don't know if it's true, that there is no object in the world that I could not cohere, if I can call it a sofa, I could also call it a couch. If I can call it a couch, I could also call it a sofa. So a bit better than student-pupil, which I think is dodgy. That doesn't mean, however, that there, you can replace one with the other. I think if we were to study every instance of these usages in Ireland, in contemporary Ireland, we'd probably find, among people who belong to the Church of Ireland, more use of sofa, and among people of Catholic background, more use of couch. I could be wrong there. That's a sociolinguistic study. That's a different kind of approach to meaning. To the semantician, if every time I encounter one, I can replace one with the other, that's a semantic relationship of synonymy. A similar relationship is antonymy, two words that mean opposite things, like up and down or dark and light. What's the opposite of chair? Doesn't have an opposite. Stupid question. And it says there's no such thing as stupid question. Say, I got one. Right? There's no opposite to chair, and everyone knows that. So not all words have antonyms. Sometimes a word has more than one meaning. That's something sem semanticians like to focus on. So let's take the word chip. You can go down to the chipper and you can order a bag of chips to go with your spice burger. Or you can go down to Intel and you can see them manufacturing the Pentium chips that go inside computers. They're obviously not the same thing. You don't put salt and vinegar on your computer. But they share an underlying meaning. 
the silicon chip inside the computer is literally a kind of a flake taken off a big block of silicon. The chip in the chipper is a flake taken off a big rooster potato and deep fried. So they do share a meaning, and that is um, expressed by the term polysemous. They are poly the, the relationship is one of polysemy. These different senses have a single underlying origin. Sometimes we find a word that has different meanings, perhaps just as different as the chip in the chipper and the chip in the computer, but they are unrelated. That's quite a different situation. The bank of a river sounds the same as the bank that you go to put your money in and rob, but they historically, if you trace those words, they don't have a common origin. There's no, they don't have a shared core of meaning, a, a similar sense. That's a different relationship, so we use a different word for it. They are homonyms. That is, they accidentally sound the same, but they're not otherwise related. Homonyms, that's one example of meaning. Hyponym is another one. Sometimes we have a, a general word that refers to a lot of things, like a polygon refers to a square and a circle and a triangle and all those kinds of things. Not sure about circles. And certainly it refers to squares and triangles and hexagons. So a triangle is a special kind of a polygon, and that's a relationship of hyponymy. We say triangle is a hyponym because it refers to a smaller subset. Hypo always means smaller than, less than. Um, Likewise, furniture is a general term, one we'll come back to later on in this course, and dressing table will be a hyponym of furniture. So those are the kinds of relations that semanticians are working with, and look what's going on. I spoke about chippers and um, furniture and so on, but we're speaking about words in a very abstract sense, quite removed from any specific real-world context. What we said didn't depend on who's saying the word or which room they're in, or what time of day it is. So we've entered this realm of abstraction now. Pragmatics is not like that, but semantics is. This is an abstract intellectual approach to meaning, and now we move down the stack one more and we reach the, the intellectual heart of modern linguistics, which is the study of syntax. Syntax is Chomsky's domain. It's the business of figuring out which sequences of words can be found within a language and which ones are not admissible. So not every sequence of words is a possible English sentence. Chomsky famously gave us this production, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. He said that's a perfectly fine English sentence, it fits the rules of syntax and it means nothing. Now you could argue that, I think that means, of course that means something, and as much as any line of poetry ever met something. It's a challenge to your interpretation. And it's quite a good one, actually. I think it, it's worked very well. The idea that it's meaningless is, to me, simply wrong. But from a Chomskyan point of view, it's meaningless, because it doesn't point to something clearly in the world. But it's, it, it's a possible English sentence. If we rearrange those words randomly, like green sleep colorless ideas furiously, we don't end up with something that is, it's like it's not even wrong. It's not a sentence whereas this one is a sentence. And this is a sentence because it fits the rules of English grammar. Each word belongs to a, a class, it's called a part of speech. We've got adverbs, nouns, verbs, uh, adjectives, nouns, verbs, and adverbs here. They are combined into larger units called constituents. So sleep furiously, furiously modifies sleep. So they form a constituent called a verb phrase. Over here we have a noun phrase built up from another noun phrase, so green ideas is a noun phrase, colorless green ideas is a noun phrase. The whole thing, together with the verb phrase, is a sentence. This recognition that sentences have internal structure and that you have to understand how the structure comes about, which words can be sequenced in which ways, this is the basic idea of grammar. Now, we need to say a word about that word grammar because it means two different things. If you're thinking of grammar as being that which you had in French class, we don't really mean that. Now, when you're teaching someone a language, you want to help them out and you want to tell them rules. If you want to speak Italian, do it this way and don't do it that way. No, that's right, that's wrong. Now, imagine a scientist who went out there and was looking up at the stars and saw, oh, there's one moving in this direction that wasn't expected. Hey, planet, you're wrong. Don't do that. We don't do that. Astronomers don't shout at the heavens. Well, they might, but it's not going to affect anything. We want to study copper. We want to see what kind of chemical reactions copper comes, can enter into. We don't shout at the copper and tell the copper it's wrong. 
Right? We study the copper. Now, linguistics is a science. It's not the business of teaching people language. That's a different business. Teachers do that. Scientists don't dictate what things should do. They try and study them. The word grammar, then, has both of these meanings. To a teacher, a grammar is a set of rules that a student ought to follow if they were going to speak proper French or proper Italian. To a scientist, a grammar is something we infer based on observation. We don't tell people what they can and can't do. We try to figure out what they're doing and what the underlying regularities are. This is similar to the distinction between the law of gravity and the kind of law that outlaws smoking a joint, for example. You can violate the law that outlaws smoking a joint, but try and violate the law of gravity. Good luck. Right? They're not the same kind of law. So grammar, as used by scientists, is more like the law of gravity. It's not a set of rules that you have to follow. It's trying to infer what the rules are that you are following. This distinction is very important. People get it confused. Linguists spend their whole life trying to clear this up. A prescriptive approach lays down the law, and that's appropriate for teachers. It's not part of science. A descriptive approach studies language as a natural phenomenon. It uses data and tries to understand how did this data come into being. Linguistics poses as a science, and so it uses a descriptive and not a prescriptive approach. Make sure you're clear on the distinction to save your linguist's friends a lot of grief. So, Chomsky has studied grammar in this technical sense for a long, he's, he's built up a very influential school, and there's been lots of competing schools and so on, and we don't have time to do any kind of justice to it. So we just note roughly where they got to as of about 10 years ago in the mainstream Chomskyan approach. We mentioned that one of the insights of Chomsky from a very early stage was that kids seem to come into the world ready to learn language. It, it, you don't get anywhere by assuming that they're just empty vessels who are filled up by exposure to language. They must be ready to learn it, because they do such a sterling job, and they learn uh, either English or Chinese or whatever the ambient language is really, really quickly. This innateness is central to his theory, and that which is innate is the universal grammar. And of late, what this means is that the universal grammar incorporates a set of principles. These are the things that make a language a language, as opposed to some arbitrary collection of rules. The idea is that languages don't vary arbitrarily. It is hard to make up an artificial language, and you need a linguist if you want to do it. You won't be able to do it on your own without any linguistic knowledge. So there are some languages like Esperanto, Klingon. Um, in the film Avatar, they invented a new language called Navi, and it was linguists from MIT were working on that to develop the language for use in the film. That's how much work they go to. So the idea is that there's a few basic principles that are common to all languages. So that when the kid is growing up, the kid needs to figure out which language is it. They're not learning language from scratch. So one of the kind of things that vary from one language to the other, one of the parameters that identify something as English or Chinese, or what have you, is the order in which words appear in a simple sentence. This is just one of the parameters, but it's a good one to look at. In English, the simple sentence, by that I mean something as simple as, John kicked the ball. In English, we go John, that's the subject, then kicked, that's the verb, then the ball, that's the object. About 40 to 50 percent of the world's languages have that basic order of subject, verb, object, SVO. There are eight possible organizations of those terms, SVO, SOV, VSO, and so on. Six, I think, are found in the world's languages, two of them are not. English represents the most common one, Irish represents a different one. So if you've, this is, will come as no news to you if you've learned Irish, and as complete novelty if you've never met Irish, but in Irish that same kind of simple sentence, it may or on, eat, I, bread. So you've got the verb first, and then you've got the subject, and then you've got the object. God, when you come to think of it like that, that is weird, right? About 5% of the world's languages have that order, which is VSO. And it's different from English, which is SVO. One of the reasons this guy is weird, Yoda, is that he takes English and he somewhat unsystematically pretends English was a different kind of language, one in which we had VOS, a very rare kind of language indeed. So when he says something like, lost a planet, Master Obi-Wan has, that's the verb first, the object second, and the subject. No, no, it's not. That's the object, 
subject verb, OSV. I've got that wrong. That's what Yoda is doing, is he's, rever he's messing with the canonical word order in English. And that pretty much generates most, most Yodaisms. So the insight here is that if we can identify things like canonical word order, then we'd have a better idea of what the details are that kids are picking up as they learn language. And as we do so, we're simultaneously learning what do all languages have in common. But notice this is all about which sequences of symbols go together in which way. It virtually doesn't make any reference to meaning at all. Syntax is just this formal manipulation of symbols based according to rules. That is, of course, very much in keeping with the intellectual spirit of the second half of the 20th century, with the language of computers becoming all pervasive, uh, the language of computation being viewed as the very basis of mind. The symbols in a computer program are defined by computer engineers. The symbols in a language, we tend to think of them as words, but we're English speakers. Not every language has the same kind of approach to words as we do. So there's a kind of a, a subset, or just beneath syntax, we get the business of word formation, which in English is almost trivial. But in other languages, is a much richer field, and this is the field of morphology. Not all languages clearly have words. You can argue that Chinese doesn't have words. Whether German has words, they're certainly different from the kind of words we have in English. So in, in English, we get a word like dog. Doesn't break down into any more meaningful constituents. That's it. If you break it down further, you're down to sounds which are meaningless. The word dogs does break down. You've got dog, which we just met, and you've got z, which is the plural marker. So there's two meaningful elements in dogs, two things that have meaning. That's two morphemes. Doubtful, we made the word doubt, it stands on its own, so that's a morpheme. And the word full, it's not a word, but you find it in wishful and fanciful and so on. So it occurs elsewhere. So there's two morphemes in that. Cranberry is kind of odd. Berry is a morpheme we're familiar with from strawberry and raspberry and blueberry. Cran only occurs in cranberry. So that's a weird one. It's called a bound morpheme. Not all morphemes are equally productive. But then we go to something like German. And we get words like Straßenbahn ritzen reine mache Frau, which means the woman who cleans the gaps in the tram lines. I made it up. You're allowed to make up words in German. You're allowed to string these things together in order to make monstrous words. So a German dictionary is organized differently from an English dictionary. English words are pretty much fossilized. German words are productive. They're constantly making new um, things that in English we'd require an entire phrase to, to say. And notice, one of the principal differences is how this is written. Now, writing is a relatively new invention, and some of the distinction we're making here between a word and a not word has to do really with how it's written. Are there spaces or are there not spaces? So you could say this is something that isn't intrinsic to language at all. Psychologists are interested in this because if you're producing, you're stringing things together, what are you stringing together? Are you stringing morphemes together? Are you string assembling the morphemes from sounds? Or are they stored? Is, is for me, Straßenbahn ritzen reine mache Frau, is that stored as one monstrous object somewhere in my brain? Or am I assembling it anew each time? So this is really interesting to psychologists as they're trying to figure out what to look for in brains in the process of speech production and speech perception. And to do this, sometimes you have to do a little bit of um, research. You have to you know, dissect a word to find out, well, what are its parts? Does it like we just did with cranberry. And I'm going to show you a little tool called expletive infixation that morphologists use, among other tools, to find out the internal structure of a word. And if you're of a sensitive disposition, please cover your ears, because I'm going to curse now in the name of science, OK? Sorry. So take a word like fantastic. Where can we put fucking in that? Fan-fucking-tastic. Not a bother. fantastic fucking stick Doesn't work. <laughs> right? Everyone can hear that. So, the difference between so the, this, that juncture between the first two syllables is clearly different from the juncture between the second two syllables. That's how good science is, man. We just did a science experiment. Uh, the morphologists do lots of stuff. Now we've, we've descended. We started off in the real world at the kitchen table, and then we entered into the logical domain of semantics. Then we go down to syntax, which was all rules, and not much reference to meaning, um, word formation and morphology. Now we're going to go a layer lower and look at sounds, but we're still in this intellectual, symbolic world, world of abstractions, and that's the domain of phonology. 
Phonology looks at the systematic organization of sounds within a language. None of these is an English word, but some of them are more likely to be English words than others. So hands up everyone who thinks scraw would be a fine English word to welcome into the family. Okay, hands up who likes slump. Everyone likes scraw, nobody likes scraw. What are you, slumpist? You know, you, you speak English, so you have a knowledge of the way that sounds in English combine. That's called phonotactics. And the sounds that can go together at the start of a syllable are different from the sounds you'll find in the middle of a syllable, and they're different from the sounds you'll find at the end of a syllable. And by God, English phonotactics are very different from Polish phonotactics. Right? Different languages have different rules. So phonotactics is the business of uncovering these kinds of things. That's a, an example of the kind of systematic organization of sounds that phonologists are concerned with. And we'll finish up just looking at two of the kind of exercises you would be doing if you were taking a class in phonology. You would start off with a load of words, examples, and you would try to infer from them some general rule. So in this case, here's a load of words. They're all singular, and we can turn them into the plural. What's the plural of lip? Lips. What's the plural of rock? Rocks. Ah, we found out what the plural marker is. It's What's the plural of tree? Tree. That's a different sound. What's the plural of latch? Latches. OK, we've got three now. English has three plural markers, and we can go through the list, and we can figure out, in each case, we're in no doubt which one. You would never mix them up. In fact, I can show you, because you just met the non-word scrawl. I hereby declare scrawl to be a word. What's the plural? Scrawl. How the hell did you know that? You've never met it before. Right? There's three possible options. There's idiosyncratic ones like sheep that don't change and so on. You learn those as exceptions. But these three are productive, and you knew which one to use. So a phonology exercise would be trying to figure out how is the choice among those three related to the sounds in the words. And it is systematically related to the sound, though we don't have time to follow it. We finish up with one more example, um, and this will wind up phonology. If you look at these words, pure, cute, tune, abuse, Jews, argue, muse, mew, they all contain you. They all contain this vowel sound. But if you go to New York, or should I say New York, you're going to hear different things. You'll hear pure, and you'll hear cute, but you'll hear tune, not tune. And you'll hear news, not news. And you'll hear new, not new. What's going on with New York, man? Do they not speak English over there? Well, they do. Obviously, they just sleep, sleep, speak slightly different English, and it's systematic. By examining these, we could come to figure out what the rule is so that we could predict, if we gave us a new word how they, that contains the vowel U, how they're going to pronounce that over in New York. It has to do with where the preceding sound is made in the mouth. Is it made around the teeth? or is it made at the lips or the back of the mouth? I'll let you figure it out. It's an exercise for you guys to play. But this is the kind of domain of phonology. It's an intellectual game where we look at a systematic organization of abstract entities called sounds, which are not well represented, incidentally, in English by letters. In other languages, they are. So tomorrow, or no, not tomorrow, Thursday, we'll pick up the story and we'll re-emerge in the real world with phonetics, which is also concerned with sound, but is quite different. <laughs>